Now, I think Sullivan finally realizes after three days in Beijing that if he makes trouble, real trouble in Ukraine before the election, and we can talk about why he might want to do that, if you will, uh, that the Chinese have said, look, uh, that would be crazy. That would be absurd. We're not going to give you the middle finger, but we're going to give you a lot of trouble where you're most vulnerable. You're aware that we have more ships than you do now in the Pacific. The Seventh Fleet, the vaunted Seventh Fleet, we have more of those things, okay? We don't have aircraft carriers because they're, they're sitting duck, but we have everything else. And we have problems in the South China Sea. You know about those things. You're encouraging the Filipinos to do things. We're going to have to make sure that you realize that if you get engaged in a major way to salvage the the war and salvage the election, the war in Ukraine, uh, you can expect to have to contend with a two-front possibility because we're joined at the hip with Russia. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I have the very big pleasure and privilege of talking to a legend of the US anti-war and pro-peace movement, and someone whose professional analysis has been heard last year even by the UN Security Council. I'm talking to Ray McGovern. Ray served as a CIA analyst for 27 years. His duties included sharing national intelligence estimates and preparing the president's daily brief. In January 2003, Ray co-created Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, VIPS, to expose how intelligence was being falsified to justify the war in Iraq. Ray, thank you so much for coming online. You're most welcome. Thank you for inviting me. I told you right before this introduction that you are one of the people who has been in the in the community of trying to talk sanity to not not just the United States, but the world at large on international affairs for a long time. Uh, we've And many of our viewers here are watching um, your videos, including when you were talking to the UN Security Council back last year, uh, which was a fantastic thing to see. Um, Ray, could you start with telling us something that's burning on a lot of our minds? Where do you get your information from? How does an a professional analyst like you stay on top of current affairs and how do you how do you separate the propaganda from actual news well, Pascal, it's really quite simple uh information is available in such quantity not quality but quantity and immediacy uh, that it's a piece of cake to apply the trade that i became accustomed to it's called largely media analysis. It's a subdivision of political science or political analysis. And uh, in working on the Soviet Union and then Russia, uh, it's about 80% of the information you need to make cogent judgments, that is, with the Soviet Union. And with Russia, it's about 90%. So uh, here's, a, here's a curious an uh, an anecdote. When Bill Casey, a uh, Russophobe par excellence, came in to be head of the CIA, at the very first cabinet meeting, he complained, you know, I found out that the analysts of Russia, the analysts of the Soviet Union, depend mostly on reading newspapers and watching speeches and, and journals and all that. They don't have many spies. <laughs> so he had this, this idea that we couldn't possibly know what was going on in the Soviet Union if we didn't have a lot of spies. And I have to confess that we had a couple, but we didn't have very many. We did have some imagery from, from satellites eventually. We had some intercepted conversations with embassy reports, and we had a few spies. But, for, but by and large, when you learn the discipline, you know, it's not hard. What the Soviets or the Russians said today Watch tomorrow. Watch what they say tomorrow. And notice the difference, if any. <laughs> There's a big clue there. And, and that's very clue to very, very, uh, very applicable today. I'm amazed that those people who pass as Russian experts 
don't seem to read Pushing speeches, there I go, I show my age here, uh, nor do they pay any attention to the most important pronouncements uh, that Putin or Lavrov, the foreign minister, make. And if they did, they would come, if they did, and if they were able to get into the major media, they would be sounding very much like me, uh, I dare say. This is one of the tricks that was pulled on us, wasn't it? To say that repeating anything that either Lavrov or Mr. Putin already said is is itself part of uh, the Russian narrative, right? We are not allowed in the general public in order to stay on the good side of society to to show understanding for the Russian position, which makes it impossible to actually then analyze the action reaction uh, a pattern that's going on. Um, but this is a relatively new phenomenon, at least at least I understood it like that. This is 20 years ago. We were not, that was not a thing. The the uh, um, Putin apologist or Putin uh, uh, um, understanding Mr. Putin was not, was not a crime. And now it has become a thought crime. How do you interpret this shift in the public narrative in the United States about um, trying to understand Russia? It's not only in the United States, of course, uh, it's widely uh, around in Western Europe. Uh, let me tell you, about 10 years ago, I was in Germany. I often visit Germany and I saw a little button and it had Putin's uh, face on it, a little, you know, kind of button you put on your shirt. And it said, Putin versteher. OK, yes. for those of you who don't know German, that's somebody who understands Putin. And I said, wow, OK, there are at least some Germans that are trying to verstehen Putin. And so I don't need one of those. And my friend said, no, God, for God forbid you wear one of those. Uh, this is this is a pejorative. Uh, anybody wearing this is is uh, is, is a Putin <laughs> apologist. <laughs> OK, or in Putin's pocket. So that's how bad it was. I was really shocked. And uh you know, I have to tell you that when I finally got back in the Soviet Union, actually it was long since Russia, after serving there in the 70s, if you couldn't believe it, uh, the the differences came through in, in remarkable ways. Uh, back then, uh, the people in the little stores that sold souvenirs or other goods, you know, they were surly, they were nasty, they, they didn't... <laughs> They didn't make any money on tips or anything like that. Well, I get back there, and I wish I had... Oh, my, the thing I do have one of my, my cups here. Uh, these young women were saying, what do you think of our... What do you think about President Putin when they heard that I could speak Russian? And, well, yeah, blah, blah, blah. I said, wow. oh, wow, you, you don't think he's uh, like Hitler? Or, no, I don't think he's like that. Oh, wow. Well, let me give you this cup. Now, Pascal, let me see if I can reach you one of these. By golly, I got one. Now, please uh, don't don't mistake me for a Putin Vashlia. Okay. But this is what they this is what she gave me for free. Okay. So this is uh Vieslivia Yudi. Okay. This is uh um polite people. And of course she's talking about the polite people who had no insignia on their uh, uniforms who Took over you could took over Crimea. Uh, the local government, uh, Kiev government, had no instructions for these people after the coup, and so these these uh, polite people, so to speak, usually uh, Yuji, they went to these uh, establishments and said, "Please pardon us. We have instructions from Moscow. You don't have any, so we're going to take over." And no one was killed in this in this terrible putsch okay and then she said now look at the other side <laughs> so i said oh here it is uh somewhere somewhere yes live we yes you did uh, the most polite of all people and <laughs> you see <laughs> Vladimir Vladimirovich. okay now i don't show this uh, very much <laughs> But what I'm saying here is these people were terribly proud of this fellow who in 1990 uh, took over the task of rebuilding a country that had been devastated 
by a whole decade of um, exploitation at the, on the part of oligarchs from East and from West. Um, they were living in poverty, a lot of them. The, the uh, mortality rate was sky high or sky low, if you will. And so they were very proud of this fellow. And they wanted me to have a, a free cup here, which I can't really save, show to anybody. I hope none of your uh, listeners or your viewers will reveal the fact that I, I said that uh, on this cup, uh, it was written, Poutine is the most polite of all people. The... <laughs> No, you know this is this is a highly interesting, of course, and we, you've been pointing this out. Others have been pointing this out. I mean, Jeffrey Sachs, time and again, how horrible the 1990s were for the Russian uh, people, right? And Vladimir Putin came in in 1999. He's now he's been now on the top of the list yeah. in in Russian uh, policymaking uh, since for 25 years. And if you look at the opinion polls, I mean, the elections in Russia were last year, right? 2023, if I remember correctly. And he's now he's in for another uh, at least five years. Right. And he the West, again, tried to trash talk these elections saying they were unfair and unfree. And, you know, the Russians are a op uh, oppressed and, uh, people. But the and these kind of goods that you're showing are just part of the propaganda machine, yada, yada, yada. But it is pretty clear to any serious Russia analyst that, that Vladimir Putin's uh, approval rate, despite all of the problems there still are, and despite the uh, the crackdown on oppositions, is rather high. <laughs> and but the strategy of the West is still to hope that something will cause in uh, you know a revolt, something like what happened with Mr. Prigozhin, right? That was the that's that's the wet dream of the West that that, that he will be pushed away from power and he have a regime change, and from suddenly Mr. Navalny or now Mrs. Navalny will be at the helm of Russia. Um, but this is highly unlikely, isn't it? Well, it's illusory. It's not going to happen. I mean, he might be shot. There might be a, an assassination. But that's the only way that, that anyone's going to get rid of Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Um, it's been 25 years, as you said, since 1999 to 2000, when he took, took over. And you mentioned Jeffrey Sachs, and he's eloquent because he was there. He took part. You know, he knew what the what the what the Harvard boys and the Wall Street boys were doing to what was earlier the Soviet economy. They were plundering it, and the result was, I think I have this statistic right in my mind here: World Bank figures. Okay, uh, the Average age at which a Russian male died in 1991 was 63, okay? In 1995, it was 57. Do the math. Those are World Bank figures, okay? There were people dying in the streets. There were people making a lot of money, those oligarchs, okay, that that Putin seems to have handled as, as well as oligarchs can be handled. He's co-opted some of them. He's put others in jail. So when they look about back at these days, and the young people in Russia, of course, uh, told these stories by their parents, you know, it's, it's not only the Nazis from World War II, it's the people who came in and took advantage of the, of the falling apart of the Soviet Union, uh, even though George H.W. Bush for whom I worked uh, both at CIA and briefing him every other morning when he was vice president, even though I think he was genuine in hoping for Europe what was a free and complete from Lisbon to Vladivostok, okay? I think he wanted that. It was possible. Uh, his, uh, his Secretary of State, James Baker, promised that NATO would not move one inch to the east it was a possible thing, and what a tragedy it was that we didn't uh, we didn't rise to the bait when uh, when President Clinton uh, was asked, uh, "How about uh, Russia joining NATO? <laughs> Why not?" You know, Russia was it just fall and it fallen apart. Now, of course, the rest of the story is 
that uh, Putin did reach out to the West. He fully expected uh, some cooperation. He got none. And so finally, he said, OK, you're getting out of the ABM Treaty. You're getting out of the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. You're getting out of open sky. Why? And we said, none of your business. And he said, OK, well, I'm going to have to build up our military to contend with this. And we're not going to waste a lot of money on impractical projects like anti-ballistic missile things. We're going to build other things like hypersonic missiles and like other things that Putin himself, in a State of the Nation address back about five years ago, did a, a, a slideshow on. You know, yeah, well, we have this missile that it goes around the South Pole and this but It's really quite amazing. Quite amazing. You know, so I think like it. But he said, now will you listen? And guess what? We said, no, because Russians are not quite, well, there's a, uh, there's a superiority complex among our, our leaders. Uh, there's a, a feeling of uh, being exceptional, of being indispensable. We got that when Bill Clinton's Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, said, look, you know, we're the indispensable country in the world. We have to act like it. And if we kill a lot of people in the process, well, what do you have that army for? What do you have that wonderful army for? <laughs> it was crazy. Now, President Biden keeps citing Madeleine Albright, saying she had it right. We're the indispensable country of the world, and it's no longer the case. And, uh, you know, in his interviews, uh, one, for example, I remember 60 Minutes, I think, uh, he says to the interviewer, the interviewer says, well, now uh, you're really in, in this proxy war in, in Ukraine, and now where the Middle East is falling apart, do you think that you can, do you think, Mr. President, that you can handle a, a, a two-front war? And he looks like his interlocutor is from Mars. And he says, what? And this is a direct quote. Why the United States? of America, the most powerful country in the history of the world, in the history of the world. Now, my God, I think he believes that. I think that Blinken and Sullivan, his Secretary of State and his National Security Advisor, have not tried to disabuse him of that notion. And so it's all illusory. These people still act like they're the dictators of the world, and they're going to learn I think the hard way, that ain't the case anymore. And when the BRICS uh, meeting happens in October and, um, and the treaty between Iran and Russia is signed, uh, I think it's a 10 year treaty, very close to a mutual defense treaty. And when, when everybody gets together in BRICS, including the new members, it's gonna be kind of a revelation or kind of a manifestation of what the world has, has been brought to it's uh, sort of uh, broken into two and uh, we are no longer the the sole ruler of the world and you know that's that's the rub of this let me add one more thing the last chance uh, that uh, putin had to persuade our president uh, it was president obama at the time to act more sensibly Toward, this, toward, toward Russia, was when uh, there was a false flag sarin, poison gas attack outside of Damascus in August of 2013, okay? Now, John Kerry immediately said 34 times it was Bashar al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad that did this, even though it didn't make any sense because Bashar al-Assad and his forces were winning in that area, okay? But that was the deal. That violated the so-called red line, and Obama was under pressure. He admits it from everybody advising him. He had to do an open war against Syria. You know, no more of the CIA. He said little stuff. He had, a, he had to send tomahawks into Damascus, okay? Well, by chance, he was appointed to go up to St. Petersburg uh, for an economic summit of some kind. He got there a day early, and Putin put, put his arm around and said, look, you don't have to do a war against Syria. I can help you. You can? Yeah. I've just persuaded the Syrians to destroy 
to give up for destruction all their chemical weapons under UN supervision on a ship specially outfitted for such destruction of chemical weapons. You have one of those ships if you let us use it, okay? That's a deal. They're going to announce that tomorrow. You don't have to do a war. <laughs> Obama says, wow, okay, a deal. Now, the point of this story is that the next week, the New York Times uh, published a op-ed by Vladimir Putin, president of Russia. What do you say? He said, I really welcome the spirit of trust that has grown, not only between our two countries, but between President Obama and me personally. The only thing that I have a problem with is this notion, as President Obama, Obama mentioned last week, this notion that the United States is the exceptional country of the world. I don't agree with this notion. I think there are no exceptional countries in the world. I think there are rich, rich countries, poor countries, people close to democracy, others not far, far from democracy. But I think when God looks at all these nations, he says, they're all equal, period, end quote. Now, I learned at the time from a pretty good source that Putin penned that last paragraph all by himself, the one I just sort of paraphrased for you, pretty, um, pretty much a direct quote. And then later, about two years later, he's asked the same sort of question, and he responds almost verbatim with what he said in this op-ed in the New York Times. Again, it was September, September 12th, 2013. So trust, growing trust, a uh, difference on whether one country can be exceptional, but arms open, we can deal, and he says explicitly, if we can do Syria, we can come to agreements on other matters. Now, that was September 2013. Six months later, Victoria Nuland and others uh, do a coup in Kiev, uh, replace the government there, the duly elected government of Yanukovych, okay? And they, this new government said, we want to join NATO. And the U.S. recognizes this coup government right away and says, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's get you into NATO. Now, so there goes the trust, the trust that went back to James Baker back in uh, 2000. 2000 well, no, he was there in 1990, for God's sake, when H.W. Bush was still president. So he was there in February 1990, made that promise NATO will not expand. Uh, Clinton started expanding it. It doubled in size. And then the coup de grace, uh, the attempt to get Ukraine into NATO, was uh, distinguished by this coup. The last thing I'll say now is most people don't are not aware that this was appropriately called the most blatant coup in history. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because Victoria Nuland was captured on an intercepted telephone conversation with our ambassador in uh, in Kiev. His name was Jeffrey Pyatt. And she says, okay, uh, Jeffrey, we got this all lined up here. Uh, we got uh, these new people coming in and she names them, okay? And then she says, now, if we need somebody with, a, with international format, if you will, uh, uh, Joe Biden, vice president, says he'll come in and, and, and glue the deal. And of course, uh, this is this is what we have in mind. And so, well, that was an intercepted conversation. I don't know who intercepted, maybe the Russians, but it was the real deal. She also says, <laughs> when Pyatt says, Pyatt says piously, uh, well, well, what about the EU? The EU is not going to like the, a coup d'etat right here in Europe. And she says, F the EU. <laughs> okay, now, I'm not going to say the word. You know what it is, right? But one reason we, we know that this is an authentic, intercepted conversation is that two days later, Victoria uh, Newland apologized to our allies, say, oh, no, I love the, I love the EU. I didn't really <laughs> mean to say F the EU. So, you know, there's the acknowledgement that was real. So all I'm saying is it took these neocons who had a, had a, had influence uh, galore on Obama as well as Biden and uh, Trump as well. It took them just six months from high trust 
prospects for more cooperation, even, you know, in, in 2013, six months for them to destroy all that, to actually create a close to a casus belli right on the border of Russia there. And we're dealing with the with the results of that now. Last thing is that they, people were forewarned about that. John Mearsheimer and, and others uh, have just made chapter and verse. John, 10 years ago in foreign affairs, said, look, what hap what's going to happen in Ukraine, given U.S. policy, is the West's fault. If the West tries to get Ukraine into NATO, it will destroy Ukraine. Now, John is no happier than I about the destruction of Ukraine, but my God, he warned 10 years ago, and we're still warning, and Ukraine is, as we speak, still being destroyed. Yeah, but this is the central point of this entire tragedy. What, you know, in the grand scheme of things, we have a very complex conflict situation actually in Ukraine with several conflicts raging, right? But one of the, the top conflict is the structural conflicts between Russia and US NATO. And the, the main issue to me here is that I cannot discern who is running US foreign policy because we the what you what you point out is that it's very important who is in these positions like uh Victoria Nuland where is she and she was the ambassador US ambassador to the UN US ambassador to to the uh to Ukraine and then under uh under secretary of of state even right she was under secretary of state the the highest position before she before she was she was not ambassador to Ukraine but all the other things she did ah, she... sorry yeah, she sorry, she was yeah, the, because of course Payet was 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 ambassador there. Sorry. But um the at the same time we have presidents who are then pressured to do things, as you as you just said. And the only thing that matters in international relations when it comes to the action reaction uh, uh, uh dynamic is what a country uh, what a country can do and what a country wants to do. Now we know that the people in charge, as you said, heavily overestimate what the U.S. can do. But that doesn't even matter, because if they believe they can, they will try to do, right? even if they can. Um, but we don't know who's running the U.S. because we found out that it is certainly not Joe Biden, uh, because even, that guy could even be exchanged for like like that, like over overnight, within three weeks, right? He was out and Kamala Harris is now in to be, to be the next figurehead or or whatever we want to call it. Who, who in the United States actually makes this foreign policy? I mean, if, if you are a Russian, if you were Vladimir Putin, who would you try to look at to understand how policy is changing inside the United States? This is an incredible black box, despite being an open uh, 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 country, like, you know, where, where like, the press is free, in quote, unquote. Yes, Pascal, it's it's not funny, really. It's uh, very odd. And uh, I spent a half a century watching Russian leaders, Soviet leaders. And, uh, you know, if I put myself into Putin's shoes here, and I don't know who's running U.S. policy, that's trouble. I have to anticipate the worst. Now, he doesn't have to be psychotic to think, that Blinken and Sullivan are running U.S. policy. And who are they? They come from a very privileged caste, never served in uniform, don't know a thing about what war is like, and have this exceptionalism, this uh, indispensability concept where they can make things happen. Now, take, take this past week. Uh, all of a sudden, Jacob... Sullivan, the national security advisor, uh, says he's going to go to Beijing to talk to the Chinese leaders. And so he does. Well, what's he doing? Well, a lot of my Chinese uh, specialist friends said, well, he's going to you know, tell them, uh, look, um, be nice to the Uyghurs and be nice to the, you know, all of that. I said, no, he's not. What he's going to do is going to sound the Chinese out about what they will do if the U.S. ups the ante in Europe, in Ukraine. What he wants to know is, is this 
this joined at the hip relationship between Russia and China real. So what I think, uh, what I think Sullivan was doing in his own amateur way was to try to ask Wang Yi, you know, his uh, opposite number, or it's actually also the uh, Secretary of State equivalent, the Foreign Minister. Uh, what do you know? What do you think of Ukraine? And what do you think of, of the, the incursion into Kursk? And, uh, you know, uh, we have an election coming up in about two months, and, and we might want to think of other options. And uh, Soto Voce, Will, will you come in and, and, and cause us trouble if we give the Russians a real bloody nose? <laughs> I asked my Chinese analyst friends, I said, do the does the Middle Kingdom have a middle finger? <laughs> in other words, does the middle does this, do the Chinese have the equivalent of giving someone the middle finger? And the answer was no, 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 they're much too polite for that. All they say, all they will do is they say that's absurd, absurd. That's their middle finger. That's the middle finger of the middle kingdom. Okay, absurd. That's what they say about U.S. policy. It is absurd. Now, I think Sullivan finally realizes after three days in Beijing that if he makes trouble, real trouble in Ukraine before the election. And we can talk about why he might want to do that, if you will. Uh, but the Chinese have said, look, uh, that would be crazy. That would be absurd. We're not going to give you the middle finger, but we're going to give you a lot of trouble where you're most vulnerable. You're aware that we have more ships than you do now in the Pacific. The Seventh Fleet, the vaunted Seventh Fleet, we have more of those things, okay? We don't have aircraft carriers because they're, they're sitting up but we have everything else. And we have problems in the South China Sea. You know about those things. You're encouraging the Filipinos to do things. We're going to have to make sure that you realize that if you get engaged in a major way to salvage the, the war and salvage the election, the war in Ukraine, uh, you can expect to have to contend with a two-front possibility because we're joined at the hip with Russia. Now, we used to talk about the triangular relationship, Pascal, you know, we'd say Russia, China, and the US, an equilateral triangle, okay? Now it's become an isosceles triangle with China and Russia, the long ends of this triangle. And let's face it, the US is, uh, is, is at the bottom. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's much smaller, and it's the, the short end of the stick, to say it in the vernacular. Now, Sullivan and Blinken didn't realize that. Just for a second here, rather, they had to sneeze. No, don't have to sneeze. Uh, uh, Sullivan and Blinken told uh, Biden before the only summit that took place in person, ju uh, June 16. 2001, they told uh, Biden that Russia was really afraid of China, that, uh, well, Biden's own words, he said, I'm not going to say exactly what I said to uh, Mr. Putin, because that wouldn't be quite regular, but but he's got this uh, thousands of thousands of miles of border with China. He knows that China is, is aspiring not only to be the major economic power in the world, but a military power. He's got to worry about all that. And, you know, China is squeezing Russia. That was the word he used, squeezing Russia. Now, <laughs> my God, that's what Blinken and Sullivan thought. And they thought they could get or they could exploit this the way Kissinger exploited it when it was an equilateral triangle, right? Now, um, what, what he's learned in the last three years is really important. I think he was read the riot act when he met with Wang He and actually met with Xi Jinping just uh, yesterday, day before yesterday. And hopefully he comes back and he says, oh, Tony, Blink Tony Blinken, my God, those Chinese, they're pretty nasty now. They say, look, you do something really dastardly, either in Ukraine or 
in the Middle East, where we have extreme interests having to do with oil and other things, uh, and you know you you're going to face uh, you're going to face enemies not only in Russia but here in the Far East, not to speak of the Iranians who are now part of BRICS and part of the Russian Chinese Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, all this other stuff. So, all I'm saying here is that. There was a kind of benighted view by these well-heeled, uh, best and brightest folks coming in, not knowing much about what the world really looks like, thinking they could push the Russians and the Chinese around. God help us. I hope they have learned something most recently this week when Sullivan heard the right heard, heard what the Chinese had to say. Whether he listened to that, I hope he did. And I hope it redounds to a more peaceful uh, policy in Ukraine, because I'm definitely afraid that to protect, to, to avoid a definitive defeat in Ukraine, that these these neophytes, Link, uh, Blinken and Sullivan, might do something really extreme so as not to lose, so as not to lose the election, and so as not to lose their freedom. Because if that other guy gets elected, he's got the book on them. They are, they are. I, yeah, I can. I have the book on them too. It's quite not. Uh, it's quite obvious. Um, Sullivan was the intellectual author, if that's the right word, of RussiaGate. It was all a great big stinking lie. Okay, in which Obama cooperated, led the led the pack by throwing out thirty five Russian diplomats on zero evidence, well, on on false evidence, okay? So this whole thing is going to come back to, to the roost, and these people are deathly afraid. As you know, Pascal, uh, lots of really important uh, decisions are made in the best basis of uh, personal, uh, <laughs> personal endangerment, and that's what I see in the U.S., and I hope the Chinese gave them a, a, really, a really realistic look at what uh, can happen if they they go after Russia in such a way, because China, of course, knows that they're next. They don't have to. They don't have to analyze that. It's in the U.S. Department of Defense um, strategic documents. China is the big enemy. We're going to get rid of Russia first, and then we'll do China. It's crazy. I have I have many questions connected to what you just said, but what are you worried about? Um, what could these people do? Because if you're right, and it is Sullivan and Blinken mainly together with a clique of other extreme neocons who are in in right now, right, in power, and they know that they have they have four months left to go. I mean, the election is going to be in November and then uh, the, the handover of power is going to be in January, right? They have four or five months left to go. Two months. Two months uh, two left to go. Yeah, two months and a few days. What yeah. can they do? What could they do in Ukraine that would be so devastating that you can stop the now crumbling of the of the Ukrainian forces in Donbas and make it look like a victory uh, to the to, for the Biden administration? What's going through your mind? Well, there have been a, a series of intelligence failures, big time. Uh, with respect to Ukraine on the part of U.S. intelligence. The National Director for Intelligence, Avril Haines, told the world openly in December of 2002 that the Russians were running out of ammunition and they had no indigenous capability to replace the arms that they're losing uh, helter-skelter in Ukraine. And that's obviously what she told the Russians. She was asked, what about this uh, new uh, alliance between Russia and China? And she said, well, they they have meetings. They 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 like to have a lot of meetings. And uh, <laughs> oh, that's the tectonic shift, for God's sake. Yeah, 40 meetings. It means something, all right? So that's the kind of intelligence. Uh, in July of last year, so just a little bit more than a year ago, the president was told to say on the 13th of July, he was in Helsinki. Uh, Putin has already lost in Ukraine. And the head of the CIA said, yes, <laughs> the, 
the the inability of the Russian military to prevail has been laid bare for the whole world to see. So that was okay. So so what am I saying here? I'm saying that there's been a terrible misinterpretation of what's going on. It wasn't the Russians that were running out of ammunition. It was the West, okay? And why was the West running out of the basic 155 millimeter uh, shell? Because there was no need to build these shells. The Russians were no threat until we overturned the government in Kiev. And then it's still more profitable for these manufacturers of armaments to build very complicated F-35s that don't always fly in, in bad weather, that kind of stuff, okay? So all I'm saying is that there were no 155 millimeter shells. Now, that's such a basic armament that I trained with 155 shells with 155 howitzers and 105 uh, uh, artillery. So wh why were there no no shells? Well, we didn't plan for it because the Russians were no threat until, okay? Now, uh, when we ran out of 155 millimeter shells, uh, Tony Blinken and Sullivan said, well, Mr. President, uh, um, they keep asking for that. And the uh, president said, well, give them to them. And, well, we don't have any more. Well, have, have the Germans or have the Italians. No, they don't have any more. Oh, well, what, what do we got? And they said, oh, we got these cluster munitions. Now, they're banned by a lot of countries, and they're pretty devastating. And uh, so, but we have them. They're on the shelf. Yeah, we'll use them, for God's sake. And so they went to cluster munitions. Now, I think they're probably out of cluster munitions at the time, at now. So what are they going to do? What else is on the shelf? Well, what do you... Here's Biden. What else you got? Well, we... Up there where the combination is, we have these these low yield nuclear weapons, Mr. President. Uh, they're called tactical nuclear president, uh, and you know uh, we can we can defer or we can we can avoid or thwart a definitive Russian win in Ukraine with just one of these things. You know, we could just drop one of these and then the Russians will show will know that we mean business and then we won't lose the election and then we won't lose uh, we won't be be vulnerable to what this new guy comes in and so yeah we might want to use those now will the military say this is crazy the military is you know the people who bub bubble up to be four-star generals my god they're political animals and I have no guarantee that these guys would say, no, that's really crazy, Mr. President. So that's what I'm worried about. Now, why are the Russians, why are the Russians saying, look, we have, we have nuclear weapons as well. We're actually thinking about rearranging our nuclear doctrine, okay? We're exercising what they call non-strategic nuclear weapons, which means uh, mini nukes, okay, and and we put some in in Belarus, and we're exercising with them, and so please, don't even think of it, okay. So what I see all these uh, Russian pronouncements as being sort of preemptive, sort of as a deterrent. Look, you guys, don't think you can do this because you can't. We have them too, and we have just as many little mini nukes, and we can do them too. So please, don't even think about it. And of course, they enlarge this and say, Lavrov, a half year ago, you Americans, very lucky. Up until now, during World War II, for example, you have two big oceans to hide behind. That isn't the case anymore, okay? You don't, the, the oceans don't matter anymore. So don't think that you're, uh, you're not susceptible to retaliation. Now, do I think the Russians are going to hit Washington? No. Uh, do I think they might hit uh, air bases in Romania or Poland? Uh, well, they might. And uh, would uh, would Washington risk um, re a retaliation of a kind that could come from Russia by doing something crazy? I don't know. These people are not really very sensible people. And neither are the Poles. Uh, you know, and, and neither are the Romanians that are in there now. So 
what I'm saying here is that the Russians are very, very worried about what could be in store in the next two months plus, okay? November 5th, do the math. And what will they do to save themselves? What will they do to prevent a definitive defeat in Ukraine? Well, there isn't anything else on the shelf, okay? That's the only thing they could use. Would they use it? My God, I, I hate to hear myself saying, I would not rule it out. It turns the hair on the back of my neck straight up. But these people are so, well, so uh, naive and so overcharged with this feeling of exceptionalism that they might say, well, maybe the Russians won't retaliate on us, at least. Uh, <laughs> they might, they might uh, do some trouble in Poland or one of those Baltic states or wherever they see the airfields. But I don't think I'll even come to that because, you know, these celebrated F-16s, okay? You know, these very sophisticated, even though they're several decades old, the F-16s, I think the, the Ukrainians bragged about getting six of them just within the last couple of weeks. Well, one of them went up in the air. And guess what happened? Just yesterday, it was shot down or it fell down or nobody knows what happened. And the last I heard, the most plausible explanation is that they didn't really share with the Patriot missile batteries the identification friend or foe, IDF uh, thing that prevents the Patriot batteries from shooting down friendly, so to speak, aircraft. So the F-16s aren't going to help either. Um, and one should remember when you're talking about knee-jerk reactions, when were the F-16s sort of put in into public view? It was when the president was in Tokyo for some kind of economic summit, I think. And uh, what happened was Zelensky came from Bakhmut and came to the president and said, we lost Bakhmut, uh, we lost 100,000 soldiers trying to defend Bakhmut. So what are we going to do now? And within a couple of hours, Biden announced, we're going to give F-16s to, to Ukraine. Now, were any military people from the U.S. with Biden when he made this big decision? No, not that I know of. So he said, okay, F-16s, and you know the whole story about F-16s. So you know how feckless this is. The Russians can shoot down F-16s as soon as they get up in the air if U.S. Patriot missile batteries don't shoot them down first, okay? So there's another thing that I would mention. The, the way the things are structured in the United States, including the military, I'm, I'm sorry to say I was a... Uh, an army officer myself in infantry and intelligence, is that the people that bubble to the top can't say no, okay? So the president says, for example, with respect to, to Gaza, uh, gosh, uh, Netanyahu won't let any food or medical supplies or water or anything else into Gaza. And uh, what are we going to do? And <laughs> a sensible person would say, well, call him up and tell him you won't give him any more arms if he doesn't let the food in. There. But no, he can't do that, okay? Because that's uh, that would get that would get the president and Democrats uh, in Dutch in trouble with the Israel lobby. So what they say? Well, uh, Mr. President, I don't know what to do. He said, "Hey, how about could we build a pier? How about a pier? Yeah, you guys, you Corps of Engineers, you build great piers. Let's do a pier in Gaza, okay? Now, in my day." the head of the Corps of Engineers would have said, now, Mr. President, we can't build that kind of pier in that kind of water because it's going to be blown apart, okay? And besides, Mr. President, when those goods get on the pier from Cyprus or from whoever, what's the guarantee that the Israelis will let them through to where they need to go? There are already thousands of trucks lined up against all the other. What do you, do you think the Israelis will let, let us get it in? Well, we know the end of the story. Uh, they built a, a kind of a pier that fell apart. Now it's been 
I've been towed to Ashkot, one of the uh, Israeli ports there. So what I'm saying is they can't say no to the president. And if I were Putin, uh, I would be thinking, my God, if these guys, uh, Blinken and Sullivan, say the president told us that we have to open that combination for these mini nukes here, because that's going to show the Russians a lesson, I dare say that there are enough guts. There are not enough guts. There are not enough integrity in the part of the Pentagon to say, that's crazy. That 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 will do us all in. We're not going to obey those orders. Uh, it, that's how we are in the, America, in, in the United States. It is absolutely horrible that we are now again closer to a uh, nuclear exchange uh, than, than like, that we've been in the 1960s with the Cuban Missile Crisis is absolutely frightening. But, you know, I, I'm, I, I still have a lot of things I would like to ask you. But the last question I have is going back to something you said about 50 minutes ago about the realignment between Russia and China. And while I do agree that they are now cooperating much more closely than they used to before, that's absolutely the case. The, the cooperation that's going on is not exactly the same as what the U U.S. has been building over the last uh, uh, 60, 70 years, this alliance system, right? A heart military alliance. That game is played by the U.S. and NATO alone, right, in order to project power. And it's really, it's a hops and spokes thing in which the U.S., I mean, we all know, everybody in the West knows that the U.S. calls the shots. That's pretty clear, even though NATO tries to say that everybody is equal. Of course not. <laughs> some 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 animals are more equal than others. We understand that. The, but the point I have is that the Russians and the Chinese don't play the same game until now, right? BRICS is sometimes um, referred to as an alliance, but it BRICS is mainly an economic vehicle for, for cooperation, collaboration between global south countries um but that might change the dynamic that we are seeing internationally right now is one where you have a heart military alliance and you have cooperating countries but we've seen how vladimir putin went to north korea and with north korea they really struck at least according to the north korean news agency if you've seen what they reported on the on the um, treaty that that is the closest thing to an actual military treaty that we've got and you're saying they're working on something similar with iran so are you think do you think that the Russians and the Chinese are now slowly going into that mode of actually, you know, actually counterbalancing with creating military, military structures amongst themselves? Because I don't think they're doing that. I I don't think they don't want they want to play that game. But if they do, then that would actually change the dynamic. How do you see it? Well, I see uh, what you're portraying here as mostly rhetoric. In other words, what the Chinese and the Russians say is we don't have the kind of alliance that is directed at other people, that makes other people enemies. Now, now, we have an alliance that looks out for our mutual interests and our individual interests, but is not directed at any third party, right? Okay, well, that's nice rhetoric, but you have to look at the, at the situation on the ground. Now, the most most surprising thing that I encountered uh, in my long purview of Russian uh, behavior was in February uh, 2022, when Putin went up to Beijing. And it's very clear in retrospect that he said, you know, um, the uh, the Ukrainians are killing Russian citizens or Russian stock in in Donbass, uh, the uh, the U.S. is putting uh, missiles in Poland and Romania. Um, we're in danger of uh, a, a real problem here on our borders. We think we may have to go in there. Okay, we think we may have to invade Ukraine. Now, uh, what did what did Putin expect in reaction? My God. China's bedrock policy, Westphalia. Westphalia. You don't intervene in other countries' internal affairs. You don't invade other countries. You never do that. That's a bedrock policy. <laughs> Instead, what when Putin says we may have to invade, uh, my view is that the uh, Xi Jinping said, uh, uh, "You mean after after the Winter Olympics are over, right?" <laughs> 
in other words, he gave us he gave us nihil obstat, his imprimatur. He, he said, "Look, we recognize what you have to do. Now go ahead and do it, but not until after the Olympics are over." And sure enough, two days after the Olympics are over, you have treaties signed between Donetsk and and Russia, uh, Lugansk and Russia. Then you have the invocation of those treaties a couple of days later, 24th, I guess, is when uh, Putin goes into Ukraine. Now, that's all circumstantial, but it's pretty persuasive to me. Witness the fact that even Chinese rhetoric changed. In other words, they weren't preaching Westphalia for those next six weeks. They were saying every country has poor values. We have core values uh, with respect to Taiwan. Uh, the Russians have core values with respect to being endangered by the expansion of NATO. We understand that. And this is this is a quote. Um, we judge each such situation on its own merits, period, end quote. That's not Westphalia. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long way from Westphalia, okay? So... What is, what is this to be attributed to? Well, the Chinese know that they're next, for God's sake. And it's very clear that they're next. And so the last thing they're going to do is allow Russia to be defeated in, in, the, in the West. And Russia is quite capable of handling things all by itself. I think they're probably getting some chips or some stuff like that from China, but it's not, it's not essential to Russia's defense. So... So China has given Russia the kind of uh, support that nobody expected. And I said I was surprised. Well, I blame it on my Chinese analyst colleagues because they all told me, oh, China would never, would never accept the Russians going into Ukraine. No, no, rule it out. <laughs> and so, you know, we, we Russian analysts always blame what happens on Chinese analysts if it has to do with what China does. So uh, chalk it up to that. But we were assured that it was, I was assured by the best people that uh, no, 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 China would never countenance that. And in reality, they did. And uh, I think it's not, uh, not an exaggeration to say that Putin would have thought, uh, thought again about going into Ukraine unless he had a very big brother right behind him saying, it's okay, we'll support you. And that brother, of course, was Xi Jinping and yeah, they keep meeting. There are lots of meetings, yeah. 40 meetings so far. That means something. And somebody should tell the National Intelligence Director of the US that when they meet 40 times, uh, you know, that's just not meetings. That means something much deeper. And that is, in my view, the tectonic shift in relations uh, of the world. And I've been at this a long time, but I should probably mention that I. I broke my teeth, or I, I started being a, an analyst for the Central Intelligence Agency in 1963, okay? And at that point, Russia and China were so at loggerheads that they were shooting at each other across their river Rhine borders. China was coveting huge swaths of Siberia taken by Russian unequal troops. Treaties and were they unequal? They sure as hell were unequal. Okay, they had all over over Vietnam. The only thing the Russians cared about was making sure that they appeared to be a staunch supporter of another com communist nation. But they were prevented by the Chinese from delivering arms to uh, to North North Vietnam, and we can we can prove that. So the whole Sino-Soviet dispute was very real, and neither side seemed to be able to come out of this self-defeating paradigm where everything they did was sort of conditioned by their mutual hatred. And as I said before, Kissinger and Nixon were smart enough. And, you know, you can say what you want about Kissinger. He's not my favorite person, Nixon as well, but they were smart, okay? And when they saw this picture that we were depicting about Sino-Soviet animosity, they came to us, Russian analysts, and said, well, do you think we can take advantage of that? And we said, well, what do you have in mind? Well, let's, we're thinking of going to Beijing. Now, they didn't ask us beforehand, 
but they did go, right? Kissinger first, yeah. and then Nixon goes in January of 1972. What comes up? Well, the mutual arms, re arms uh, control, the U.S.-Soviet arms control uh, that was coming to a ripening uh, with respect to limiting um, anti-ballistic missiles and uh, or an interim agreement on offensive missiles. Uh, we were in the thick of that. I had three people in my branch that were with the SALT, the Strategic Arms Limitation Talk delegation, okay? And uh, they were with them in Helsinki or Vienna, and then we had two people backing them up at headquarters. And I got to go to Moscow uh, for the signing in May of 1972 of the assault agreement and the other agreements there. Now, why was that? That was partly because the Russians were so afraid, so afraid that the Chinese would steal a march on them in improving relations with the United States that they had to act more responsibly. In the interim, we had a new agreement on Berlin, for God's sake. Never happened before. So there were signs there, and we could tell. You know, we're, we're usually criticizing or saying that this policy or that policy doesn't work. We could tell for in a unique time here, we could tell Kissinger, look, uh, it does appear that one of the impetuses uh, for this agreement uh, with Russia is their fear that China will, will steal a march on relations with the United States. So that's what we saw at the time. And people thought, and we thought, you know, naive as we were, that these two would hate each other forever. It was almost a racial thing. And it, there was irredenta and all this other stuff. We were wrong, okay? And I have to say that gradually we could see that we were wrong. And we told us earlier, we told Pre uh, Secretary of State Schultz, look, it looks like they're they're putting their the, their differences aside and they're cooperating in a way you haven't seen before, uh, but we still you know yeah. Yeah. Didn't have the conviction in in being able to say look, if Putin decides he has to go into Ukraine, do you think the Chinese would ever bless that? I still couldn't believe that they they could, but they did, and that thereon hangs a really tectonic shift of. China seeing its own interests prevailing here. Westphalia, okay, they're, they're back talking about Westphalia, okay. But with this alliance, it's very, very strong. I think the Chinese and the Russians are right in describing it as a, an alliance that has no upper end, okay. And if there's trouble in Ukraine that threatens to get out of hand, my bet, and I've been saying this for years now, for two years at least, that I think the Chinese will stir up more than just rhetoric, more than just the serious warnings that they used to issue back in the 60s and 70s, that they have lots of, of things they can do in the South China Sea. I don't think so much in this Taiwan Strait, but uh, there are lots of things they can do to, to threaten a two-front war. But those uh, benighted leaders that are leading our foreign policy in Washington uh, I don't know if they get it yet. Maybe maybe this week with Sullivan having talked to the very top Chinese, maybe he's finally got the word that the U.S. is no longer such an exceptional or such an indispensable country in the world that they can do what they want even in Ukraine. Ray, this is very enlightening, and I still have a lot of things I want to talk about, and maybe we do another session in yeah. in the coming weeks. But um, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for all of your analysis and your great work. Um, Ray, where should people go to follow you? What's the best direct uh, channel, the way to, to follow your analysis? Well, uh, I usually... Uh... I actually write things quickly now, uh, and I put them on uh, X, the X. former Twitter. Uh, but then the next day, they're on my website. And my website is raymcgovern.com. Uh, easily remembered. Uh, actually, uh, it's easily searchable as well. There's a nice little search thing up there that my son has composed. And my son, who does all this work, tells me, uh, Dad, uh, Always mention the website, but also add, if you don't get it, you don't get it. 
but I'm much too modest and humble to, to mention that. Uh, Thank you very much. Everybody go to X, go to Ray's uh, website. Uh, everything will be linked below. Ray McGovern, thank you very much. Thank you, Pascal.